Uh, I'm from Dallas, Texas. Anybody been to Dallas, Texas? All right. Have some barbecue while you were there? That's right. Boy, I miss my barbecue when I come to Europe. I'll tell you, there, nobody in Europe can seem to do good barbecue, sadly. If I was an entrepreneur, I would bring Texas barbecue to Europe and teach you all how to eat. But uh, actually, this is my first time in the Netherlands. I'm excited to be here, actually, because it's kind of uh, old home week for me. I'm actually partially descended from people from the Netherlands. Uh, some ancestors of mine named Newkirk went over to the, U- to the New World with a guy named Peter Stuyvesant. You guys have heard of Peter Stuyvesant, right? Yeah, my, my family were, were the Newkirks that went over with him. And uh, they're sort of infamous because apparently they didn't get along with the dude. And he was kind of cranky, apparently, because in the New York City Public Library, we found some records of, of him uh, sentencing them to death for criticizing him, right? So uh, apparently, free speech wasn't all it was cracked up to be, you know, in the 1600s. Although he was very magnanimous, he commuted the sentence of Mr. Newkirk to, uh, you know, they pardoned him and he was very gracious about that. But Mrs. Newkirk, he didn't think quite so highly of, apparently. And so he sentenced her to stand in the middle of Central Park uh, all day long with her tongue sticking out into a forked stick. And uh, so there, there you have the difference between, uh, you know, men and women, right? The, at least according to Peter Stuyvesant. So anyway, let's talk about zero trust, huh? Uh, we're gonna put zero trust into a, co- a, co- a big context for you so understand why we did zero trust. Zero trust is a way that we're thinking about everything at Forrester, networking and security, how we can pull it together, identity, all that kind of stuff. It does a lot of different things. So in order to understand it, we're gonna talk to you about some of the reasons why. So today I'm gonna cover first, uh, the data economy. I'm gonna welcome you to the data economy. You have to realize that we're switching right now, at this moment, between an information economy that we've been hearing about for a long time to a pure data economy. It's a pretty transitional, foundational shift, not transitional, it's foundational. And um, it's causing a lot of problems because people don't understand the whole data part of it. So the data issues are pretty big. And so we're gonna talk about that. And because of this switch that we're, we're, that's taking place, something is broken, and I wanna tell you what is broken so that you can move forward and understand how to fix this. I'm gonna kinda adjust this a little bit so I can see that better. And then uh, I'm gonna talk to you about zero trust, what that means, and how you can implement it, and we'll leave you with some final thoughts. Of course, uh, we'll have some time for questions, and I'll be around all day. There's not too many places I can go, right? I'm not gonna, you know, I can't just uh, take the tram over back to Dallas. So I'm, I'm here all day for you. So uh, the first thing to know is I'm from Texas. We think about oil a lot, and I wanna tell you data is the new oil. And the reason I say that is because if you have a bucket of data and a bucket of oil, they both have value. Right, if you take a barrel of raw crude oil, it has value today on, in a market. And if I had a bucket of data, any kind of data, it would have value. A lot of people don't understand that their data has value, but it's the first and most important concept that you need to understand in order to deal with what's going on. How many people have been hearing about what's going on with the NSA? Usually I like to welcome them to any speech that I'm giving. I'm assuming they're just dialed right into my microphone here. How's everything going in Fort Meade? So those guys are funny. One time I was at an event and, and uh, we were going through the line, you know, uh, to get some food. And I said to the guy next to me, to me as we were sitting down, I said, how's things going over at the, C- at, uh, the NSA? And he looks at me and he got this really weird look, kind of scared. And he st- stood up and he, he left and about 10 minutes later, he came back and sat down next to me and he says, well, I was told it's okay to talk to you. I said, oh, great. <laughs> and he said, by the way, how did you know I worked at the, at the NSA? And I said, your badge says Fort Meade on it. It wasn't like I was some great genius, it's just you weren't very good at hiding who you worked for. So uh, 
So data is the new oil, and the NSA wants your data, and foreign governments want your data, and your business uh, competitors want your data, everybody wants your data, you want your data, your marketing people want your data, everybody wants your data, and we all talk about it in terms of big data. How many people have heard the term big data? Of course you have, yes. And we're gonna talk about what big data is, because we had little data, yesterday's data, this is it, right, very organized, easy to figure out what's going on, filing systems, when was the last time anybody ever saw a paper file? You know? Oh, you, you've seen one lately? I'm very old fashioned. You're very old fashioned? Yeah, oh. I, I'm one of those barbecues. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, I'm sure that there's a program that you can go through, a 12 step or something. So let's talk about big data. What is big data? Well, I'm going to show you what big data is. This is big data. There it is. Big data is the garage that IT built for the business. You have garages here in the Netherlands? They're messy, aren't they? You throw all your crap in the garage, and then the whole time that you look at your crap and your wife tells you you should clean out the crap in your garage, this is actually a, not a very messy garage compared to my garage. My wife wouldn't let me put the picture up here. She said it was too embarrassing. You know, I have a set of golf clubs from 1973. They're made of wood. Yeah, I, why do I still have those? I will never use them. But you know, I might not need them for something to show off, and that's what big data is. We just throw all our crap in the garage. We store it on big uh, hard drives that we, that we call big data servers, and that's, that's big data. It's the, IT, it's the garage that IT built for the business, so the business could throw things in there, even though only about 20% of the stuff that's ever in there, they're gonna look at or use again. But they just want it all, right? Do you have the idea of, do you, do, you have, do you see the TV show Hoarders here? Do you know the TV show I'm talking about where people just collect like newspapers for no reason? Well, that's big data, right? And then for those of you who wanted to know what the cloud is, I brought a picture of that too. There's the cloud, right? The cloud is, I ran out of stuff in my garage so I gotta rent some extra garages. That's what the cloud is. So how do we control that? Do you guys see, ever see the TV shows like uh, Storage Wars where people auction off storage things? Well, this is what happens. That you forget that you have this out there in the cloud and suddenly it's being auctioned off or more likely stolen, right? So if you don't know that the stuff is there, how are you ever gonna protect it? And if you don't know what's in there, gee, where did I put that really precious uh, set of, of sterling silverware that we got from auntie b back when we got married 40 years ago. I don't know, it's in one of those, it's in the cloud somewhere. No one knows where things are. So that's kind of a big problem. So the reason that we're moving to a data economy is data has value. Raw data without any context, hasn't yet been turned into information, has data. And this is something that a lot of people can't get their minds around. But somebody like say Google, you've heard of this little company called Google? They've figured out how to monetize raw data. It's actually quite brilliant. They take these things called searches and turn them into money using advertisements. But what they're doing is monetizing raw data, the search. They figured out how to do that. And a lot of companies are doing that now. So you don't have to throw a lot of context, but you do need a lot of data. So this is an, this is an IRC chat room. This is an IRC chat room that I hope you don't go to because it's a very dangerous place to go. It's what I call the invisible internet. It is an underground uh, marketplace similar to a stock exchange, only instead of buying and selling stocks, you're buying and selling raw data. So I've got a couple of, uh, I got an example here. I've kind of pulled out some of the stuff that's from that screen capture. Here's somebody saying, I need RDP. RDP, uh, remote desktop protocol. How many people in the room use that in their, your company? Yes, of course you do, right? This is something that you have. You don't even think of RDP as being data, do you? Look at somebody wants to buy RDP in the US, UK, Germany, uh, now f via WMZ, which is stolen money that they have a way to exchange in these markets for $9 US. And so later on, somebody comes in and he says, hey, hey, you wanna buy some? I got some to sell. I have a good offer. I'm selling hacked RDP, but I'm guaranteeing it to be up for 24 hours a day. How does he do that? Is it his? Well, yes, it's his. Does he own it? He owns it. 
Does he manage it? No, so that belongs to you, your company. He knows it never goes down because you might need it for doing remote administration in the middle of the night, so it's always up and running. So he says, I'm gonna sell that to you for $10. So the guy wants to buy it for nine, he wants to sell it for 10, they're gonna make a deal for nine and a half, and that's what we call a market. There's a real-time market for stolen data. You don't realize it, but it's happening every single day. So that means the data has value and that we're in a data economy. So how are we gonna deal with this data? We're gonna deal with this data by putting it into a framework, we call it the data security and control framework, and this is gonna lead into a bigger discussion about zero trust in a moment. Trust me. So we got to do, first thing we have to do is define our data. We have to do data discovery and classification. Almost nobody knows what data they have and almost nobody has classified it uh, to know how toxic it is and which data they need to protect. Then we're going to dissect it, data intelligence uh, and data analytics. I call it security analytics, wrote a report about it. Q1 Labs in the back there is a data uh, intelligence platform, fits in the dissect data part of this uh, equation. And then finally, once we've done that, we can defend the data, we can protect it. And when you are trying to protect a piece of data, there's really only four things that you can do. There's hundreds of products you can buy, but they can only do four things to protect any piece of data. I can put access control against it. You know, access control is really important. We need to do access control on a need to know basis and enforce it very strictly. That's one of the key tenets of zero trust. You people have heard of the Bradley Manning uh, debacle, the Edward Snowden debacle. Were those guys hackers? No, there was no access control against them. There were policy statements, don't give our data to the wrong people, but there was nothing to enforce it. And so they chose not to, uh, to accept the policy. So the fact that they were able to do that was an access control problem. Then we need to inspect uh, the data or inspect the traffic going to the data. Is there threat traffic going to the data? Is it, if we inspect it and ask, have I ever gone to that and looked at that data before? You know, uh, Edward Snowden, has he ever gone and done this before? No, I wonder if he should be uh, uh, doing that. No one asked that question of Edward Snowden. Then we need to dispose of it, get rid of it, uh, delete it. We keep too much data and a lot of it can only be embarrassing, right? Data should be expired whenever it can be expired and it's useless to you. So a lot of data you might need to keep for X period of time for compliance purposes, but ultimately uh, there's gonna be a lot of data that you, you should get rid of because it can only get you in trouble, right? If there's a lawsuit, e-discovery, something like that. Get rid of it if you don't need it. And then finally, most importantly, and where the world is gonna go, is we need to kill our data. I like to say the only good data is dead data. The only good data is dead data. Killing data is the abstraction of data by tokenization, data masking, or encryption. So for example, when you look at any data breach privacy law, it only uh, pertains to unencrypted data. So if we properly encrypt data and we do the proper key management, it's dead data. It has no meaning or value until we can decrypt it. So we could post it on the internet and if we did key management, no one would care. Ultimately, the only way we're gonna solve things like nation state attacks, uh, the use of mobility at scale, and, uh, and things like the NSA and, and all these other things is through advanced uses of cryptography and killing the data because we strip the value right out of it and therefore it can't be monetized by attackers. We can get rid of that marketplace in the background because all they will have is gobbledygook. They can't do anything with it. And so that's the value. So all this leads into uh, the idea that right now we can't really do what I envision because something bro is broken. And what's broken? Well, the trust model is broken. We have this old idea of trust but verify. Do you guys have that term over here, trust but verify, right? Trust but verify, it's a joke. Not, not just figuratively a joke, it's a real live joke. It comes from a joke. It's a joke that, uh, that Ronald Reagan made to Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987 when they were signing a nuclear disarmament treaty. And he said to uh, Gorbachev, he says, Mr. Gorbachev, we are so excited that, that you have agreed to sign this treaty with us, but of course we're gonna abide by that old Russian proverb, dovrene no provrene, which of course means trust but verify. And they all laugh 
because of the nuance of the proverb in Russian, dovrene no provrene, trust but verify, is the opposite about, of whatever person took this in the English language. He said, that's a really a good idea. We'll make that the basis for all information security. You know, trust but verify, that's the old KGB term, right? We're gonna do trust but verify, boom. That's what it is. It's completely opposite, and, and Reagan knew that. That's why he said it in Russian first. But nobody figured out the nuance of the Russian proverb, dovrene no provrene. We gotta get closer to dovrene no provrene. The biggest problem we have today is this idea of trust in a network. Biggest problem. It's the fundamental problem and we have to get rid of it. If we can get rid of it, then we can start doing some radical things that will actually protect our data. That's the goal, isn't it? The goal of our whole business, when you get right down to it, is one thing and one thing only, be, keep data from being exfiltrated into the wrong hands. That's ultimately what we're trying to do. So, guys installed any old firewalls back in the day? I used to install a lot of firewalls, right? It was always the trusted port and the untrusted port. But in today's world, which one goes to the internet? Which one, you know, back then, untrusted port, that was, the evil internet. It's always evil. Everything in the internet is evil. And the trusted internal network, because they're trusted users, they're good people. Who lives in the trusted network? Edward Snowden, Bradley Manning. That's where data breaches come from. And in fact, if I breach your firewall, that untrusted port, and move an atom or, or an electron a couple of microns down a wire, suddenly my, tr my trust status gets elevated because of this model. Oh, you're now on the internal network, great. That works, okay, now you must be trusted because you're here. The fact that you exist in that network means you're trusted and it's totally wrong. So we have a new concept, it's pretty simple. Looks like that, zero trust. Untrusted and untrusted. Now, whenever I do this and talk about this, people say to me, John, and they always are, they're really condescending sometimes. John, you know, you're saying people are not trustworthy. And I say, no, I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying something much more fundamental. How many people are on the network right now? Who's on the network, on a network? You're not on a network. You're sitting right there. Did you shrink yourself down into a really teeny tiny submicroscopic anatomic particle and, and run down a wire somewhere? No. People have never been on a network ever. Atoms, electrons, photons, that's what runs down networks. Packets run down networks. People are not on networks. We do not need the idea of trust to make things work. There is no trust flag in TCP. We don't need it. So I'm saying that people are not packets. And this whole game is all about packets. I'm saying there's no trusted packets, no trusted users, no trusted devices, no trusted anything. And if I give everything the same trust level zero, then I can uh, uh, look at each and every packet in the same way. And it actually simplifies my policy and makes sure nothing gets past me. Anybody ever uh, implement an old uh, PIX firewall from Cisco? Any PIX guys, right? You have the adaptive security model. If you're trust level zero, trust level 100, 50, 40, whatever, and anything that's going from a higher trust level to a lower trust level doesn't even need a rule. Well, a lot of attacks happen because of that. So we gotta get rid of that into zero trust. There's some basic concepts to zero trust. This is a very modular, designed to do a lot of things and meet challenges moving forward. First one is uh, all resources or access in a secure manner regardless of location. I wrote this five or six years ago before mobility and the iPad took off, but we could see it was coming. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, but you still need to securely access resources. Two, access control is on a need to know basis and must be strictly enforced. I wrote this long before Bradley Manning, right? Bradley Manning, he went to the NSA in uh, Iraq where he was stationed and he said, hey, you gonna be looking for anybody doing bad things on the internal network? And the NSA guy says, nah, we're only looking for people, bad guys on the outside, you know, terrorists, those kinds of things. Okay, great. Then he goes and he does his thing. You know, 
He, he, he knew that no one was gonna be looking for him. And in fact, the only evidence that Bradley Manning did the Bradley Manning attack, which, uh, or the WikiLeaks attack, as sometimes it's called, is some chat logs that he sent to somebody else admitting it. But there's no actual physical evidence because they weren't even monitoring the network. They had no logs. There's no physical evidence. Next, our new trust model, verify and never trust. We don't need trust. Trust never works. You know, Julius Caesar proved that, didn't he? Trust never works. So uh, after that, we uh, inspect and log all the traffic. People used to say to me, oh, that sounds so hard. I'm not saying go to every piece of, every network segment with, with a laptop and Wireshark. That's why you have tools like a Q1 Labs, like lots of other security analytics tools that can look at all the, net, all the data from the network inside and outside. By the way, don't just look at the outside of your network, the old SIM tools. You have to look at the inside of the network as well. If you don't know what's going on in the inside of your network, you're in real trouble. And then all of this allows us to design the network from the inside out, completely invert it. And that's what Zero Trust as a design concept does. We start at the data. Whenever I'm doing a Zero Trust design uh, workshop or helping with the design of a network, I always start at the data. Everybody wants, well, where should we put the firewall and the this and the switch and the that? No, where's your data? Huh. How does it work? How does it flow across your network? Who has to have access to it? Who should be allowed to have access to it? Start at the data, design the network from the inside out. That's how we design, that's how, uh, Cities are built, right? Cities are built and then roads are built to go from one city to another. People don't just build random roads and then say, well, the road ended, we better build a city there. But that's how we've been doing networking for a long, long time. So, how do you design the Zero Trust Network? There's some concepts that you can use. First, let's look at the traditional hierarchical network, right? You guys know this network. It has an edge, a core, a distribution layer, and an access layer. This is a really, really old design. This goes back to last century. Last century. This goes back to the 1980s, the 1990s. In internet time, this is uh, Paleolithic. It is so old. In fact, of all the things we do in IT, this is the oldest thing we do. We don't code in, in straight machine language anymore like we did in the 70s. But why do we build networks the same way? Well, because the people who are in charge of networks uh, or in charge of selling you network equipment, certain companies don't want to change it because then they'll lose some market share. That's how people are incented, money. Well, I don't build anything, right? I, I have the freedom to say, well, this is a bunch of crap. Let's figure out what we could do to get rid of it, right? Because I know this is really hard to secure. It is impossible to secure this kind of network because security is always an overlay. So we just add thing after thing after thing after thing after thing. And not only do we create a whole bunch of things and problems and routing problems, management problems. Oh, man, these things are hard to manage, aren't they? And at the end of the day, they don't really stop uh, the, the real attacks. Every single breach that's ever happened has happened against these networks, and we still build them the same way. Be like, our building keeps falling down, so we're gonna build it the same way and go, huh, it fell down again. Wow, isn't that wild? So if we de deconstruct this network and take out the things we need to do from a security standpoint, because ultimately, I care about security first. Security becomes the structural engineering that holds the building up. Uh, we can see that there's things you're gonna need to do. You're gonna need to do things like firewalling. You're gonna need to do things like IPS. And by the way, web application firewall is really a type of IPS, it's not a firewall. You're gonna have to do some sort of access control, not, I wouldn't say NAC, but the concept of NAC. Uh, you're gonna have to do some content filtering. You're gonna have to do some activity monitoring and you're gonna have to do a whole bunch of encryption. Well, five years ago, we were uh, saying, we could do this, man, if we could just get somebody to build a box that put them all together on the same thing and then uh, added some way to route packets or forward packets around, we could rebuild the network in another way. And what was exciting to me is when the next generation firewall market started, suddenly this thing that I'd been hoping for and writing about was there, 
right? We call this not a next generation firewall, but a segmentation gateway. Now, the reason for that is a couple things. One, if I, first of all, to call a next generation firewall a firewall of any kind is a disservice to the product. No offense to the folks at Palo Alto, but it's a disservice to the product. These are much more like IPSs on massive amounts of steroids. Firewall is a layer three device. Next generation firewall is a layer seven device. In fact, at Forrester, we don't even use the terms next generation firewall, next generation IPS. Because uh, they're, they're, they should be the same thing over time, right? And the vendors who, who haven't built a next generation firewall and say you shouldn't have next generation firewalls, they need to be separate and disparate, only say that because, uh, you know what, they can't do it. They can't build it yet. So they have to say that you shouldn't do it because they can't build it. But you should do it. You should have a next generation firewall, but you should use it not as a firewall because if you use the word firewall in your mind, you're gonna to wanna to put it on the perimeter. These do, should not be on the perimeter. These are next generation firewalls that are very fast, have multiple 10 gig interfaces. Uh, they build security into the very DNA of the network. Let me show you how we build them here. So this is the future of network de uh, security design. Is anybody working on transforming their network into a zero trust network in the room? Yeah, I've got a few people. Yes, I, uh, this is exciting to me because actually of all the countries in the world, the Netherlands seems to get it. I don't know why that is, but there are more people that I hear from all the time, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're doing it. And I mean, to me, that's very exciting because five years ago, I couldn't get anybody to listen to me. You know, they thought I was a crackpot. Uh, thankfully, there were crazy people in the world going to break networks in ways that we never imagined, so I, I seem like a visionary now. I went from being insane to being a visionary. I guess that's how, how it happens. So we have this idea of an MCAP, right, where we can segment networks out. All modern networks are gonna have to be segmented. That's just the way it is. There's a lot of reasons for it, but they have to be separated. So we created the idea of an MCAP, micro core and perimeter, where you could separate uh, various sets of traffic according to the type of data and the, the type of functionality, and there would be similar policy attributes globally at the interface, whether that interface is virtual or, or uh, physical, logical, it doesn't really matter. In this case, these are we're looking at hardware interfaces, but more to understand the concept from a block diagram thing. So we have a World Wide Web MCAP and a user MCAP. That tells you the types of traffic that's going to be there. So this allows us to manage all these things centrally. And at the end of the day, management is the new backplane. If you've got a big, massive Cisco 6509, 6513 switch with a 720 gig backplane, why does it have that big, massive black backplane? Not because that's the way you should build switching architecture, but because back in the 80s when these concepts were created, that was the only way to get the port density they needed with any kind of manageability. It was a management problem. Now we can manage things through things like software-defined networks. So it, we abstract the management and we don't care where the lo physical locality of the switches are so we can create separate switching infrastructures. That's what Zero Trust does. Next, we need to inspect and log all the traffic, right? And that's easy to do because we can send everything to what we call a DAN, Data Acquisition Network, using the forwarding packet forwarding engine in the uh, segmentation gateway where our SIM and NAV, NAV stands for Network Analysis and Visibility, it's metadata analysis, it's uh, flow data analysis, packet capture analysis, and it's merging together, those two things together, SIM plus NAV, we call that security analytics. That's the type of product that, that Q1 Labs has right now, right? There's a few vendors who have actually, uh, RSA, named their product after my paper. It's called Security Analytics, and it does exactly what I said it should do. So uh, we're seeing the, the, the traffic uh, all being inspected and logged at scale so that we can know what's going on. There's tremendous value in that. We can see whether or not Edward Snowden is doing something bad if we're looking at the traffic that Edward Snowden is generating. The problem with the NSA and, uh, and the, the network that he was on was they weren't looking at his traffic. It was invisible to them. Next, uh, we want to have very virtualized VMware-ready uh, networks. Now, all the people who run vMotion want very flat networks, don't they? 
They want these big layer two flat networks because that makes it easy to do vMotion, which is lovely, except if you have a flat network, uh, it also makes it easy to hack. So if you're a hacker, you love virtualization because now you can own the entire network much easier than just a segment of a network. So within this, we, we secure VMs by default because we create areas where you can put those VMs. We don't care whether it's a virtual system or a physical system, but we do care about things like compliance. So in this case, how many have to deal, people in this room have to deal with PCI? Anybody? Credit card security? Oh, come on, there's gotta be more than that. Yeah. Whether or not you know it, uh, if you're in healthcare, for example, and you take credit cards uh, to pay your bill or to, to buy food in the cafeteria, you have to do PCI. So you will learn about PCI, and then you will call me because I'm a former QSA. And uh, I, a lot of this came out of trying to sec secure uh, PCI networks and make them compliant. But for example, in VMware, if the guy, if the guy using the work controlling the workloads, which is my least favorite word in all of IT, because it makes no distinguish, it doesn't distinguish between even toxic workloads and non-toxic workloads, the workloads that have data that if it gets lost, you get in trouble. But for PCI, if, and I've seen it happen, you put your uh, e-commerce server and your database server on the same piece of v virtualized hardware, you're suddenly out of compliance. You've created a significant risk to the business. Not just a risk from a tax, but a risk for compliance fees and getting yourself in real deep, uh, I don't know, you know, the stuff you step in. You'll get into that. That's why I wear cowboy boots all the time too, by the way. It just makes it easier to get that stuff off. It doesn't get on your socks and stuff. I know I'm gonna step, it, step into it a lot in my job, so. Uh, so we'll, we'll be able to secure to, uh, this by default because, hey, SQL as a protocol won't even run across this MCAP. Just won't be allowed. Only worldwide web traffic goes there. So if you make a mistake, you'll go, my, my thing isn't working, and then they'll go back and they'll go, okay, uh, oh, I see. Well, you made a mistake in the way you deployed it. Uh, next, uh, these things are designed to be compliant, right? Again. PCI says there must be a, wired, uh, a firewall between the wireless network and the wired network. Very, very important. How many people have wireless in the room? How many people have a firewall between your, your wired and your wireless network? A few of you. One of the big problems we have is the term WLAN. W, wireless, LAN, local area network. It is not a local area network. It's just not. It's an internet. It's a publicly facing network. Understand that. Very easy to, to break. I made my, my bones breaking wireless networks and voice over IP networks. That's how I got at, into Forrester was because I'm sort of a quasi hacker. And wireless networks were always the easiest one to get in and no one ever noticed we were there when I ran pen testing teams. So make sure that you have a wire, uh, firewall between your wireless and wired networks by default Zero Trust puts that in there and it helps make you compliant by default. Next, it's scalable. I can make as many MCAPs as I want. It really doesn't matter. It, these are like Lego blocks. You know, I can make a TIE fighter or I can make a Death Star. It doesn't matter, the same blocks do that, right? So if you've ever played Legos, this will work for you, right? It's the same concept. You get, you get a lot more flexibility and you can make it work for your environment. Uh, Next, uh, it's uh, segmented by default. So we need to take certain toxic data types, in, in, in this case, cardholder data, and we need to segment it away so, that it, so it's harder for the hackers to get to it, right? So uh, in PCI, it says you must move your cardholder data into its own segmented network. That's a requirement. That requirement should be thought of as a best practice for anything else where you have highly toxic data, healthcare records, personally identifiable information, anything that is what we call toxic. You wanna to have that segmented away. This does that by default. It allows you to easily segment your networks. And then this is very flexible. We can do all kinds of things with it. Here I've shown a load balancer uh, that we're gonna put into the uh, environment. We're not just limited to whatever our vendor says. These are, these are the switch offerings that, that we have. Don't care. I'm gonna free you from the tyranny of, of being a Cisco shop. How does that sound? 
You don't have to buy everything that they, that they offer, right? You don't, and then worry, are they gonna end a life it? You can pick and choose the things that you want that fit and that are flexible for your organization. And then finally, uh, this is extensible too. One of the things in a, in a hierarchical network, there are no choke points. If there's no choke points, there's no place to look at the data and there's no place to protect it. So you spend all your time making these weird VLANs in and out of everything. And VLANs, of course, are not a security control. VLANs are very easy to break. VLANs are the white lines on the highway that tell you don't cross this. But if you want to, you can, nothing's stopping you. VLANs provide zero security value, right? They're, 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 they're made for breaking up uh, collision domains and such in networks. Uh, so don't think of them as a security control. I mean, you can use them to improve security, but hey, uh, you need to go well beyond that. So you need some choke points. We put choke points in place by default and using software-defined networks and fabrics, right? Because fabrics are the next thing. That's what's gonna happen. Fabrics, software-defined networks, doesn't really matter what you call it. Um, I like the term fabric better than SDN myself, but. Uh, there's going to be different things. It's all the same thing. It's about, it's about meshing networks differently and, and controlling them uh, from a, a layer of abstraction that's different than what you're doing today. So in the future, sorry, Marco Rubio no, moment there. Uh, no one gets that in here, do they? Do you guys know who Marco Rubio is? He was a, he's a, He's a senator from, from the United States in the middle of an important speech. He awkwardly took a drink of water. So uh, in the US, we call those a Marco Rubio moment. Sorry. So we're moving from this hierarchical network anyway, right? Uh, there's a few vendors who don't want this to happen, but it's still going to happen. And we're going to go to a mesh topology. Now, what happens there? Because if you talk to those people and you ask them, what about security? Uh, they don't have security, generally. They're still going to overlay security, but you know what? It makes it even easier to do zero trust. Brocade, I, who's here from Brocade? You guys know Duke? Do you guys know Duke from Brocade? No. You don't know Duke? So Duke and, and Danell from Palo Alto and I spent the last year going around the world preaching this uh, to clients everywhere. And Brocade and Palo Alto actually have a off-the-shelf zero trust uh, offering. You can buy a zero trust network off the shelf where uh, the Palo Alto tells the Brocade how to send traffic to it. It's pretty amazing. This stuff is happening in real life. And because of these fabrics and the SDN, the, those SDN vendors are going to need to be able to do uh, more and more security. I was talking to one of the vice presidents at VMware, uh, the uh, NSX, NYSERA ac acquisition, uh, about all of the clients that, that they have that they're turning towards zero trust networks because NSX makes doing zero trust really, really easily. You can pick and choose your segmentation gateway, set a policy, and lo and behold, you're done with it. So that's going to be the future, right? Now, the one thing we did is, unlike uh, other people, I don't have any hardware to sell you, so I'm, I don't have any skin in that game, and I didn't want it to be a rip and replace thing, didn't want to be in that fight. I don't even think it's the right way to do it. We see this as an augmentation. Create a zero trust network for a particular data type that you need to deal with, and then augment that or attach it to your existing network, and then over time you can expand it. And we have a lot of customers do it. This presentation demonstrates PCI uh, because, first of all, PCI is what I call the world's largest vertical market. It's the only compliance initiative that's the same for everybody in the entire world who has to deal with it, and that's most companies. Most companies do have a PCI requirement. A lot of them don't know it yet, especially outside of the US where, where there's been more education. But you can use PCI as the baseline for everything you do. I call it PCI Unleashed. If you're trying to figure out how to do good password management, look at the PCI requirements because they're the most specific of any compliance initiative. And all of that stuff is built into Zero Trust. So uh, there's reasons why now is the time to do this. It's the exact perfect time. There's a whole bunch of network refresh drivers in, in here. Uh, segmentation, reason. Compliance, 
If you gotta do compliance, building a compliant network is gonna be hard in, in the traditional, re, uh, traditional hierarchical world. Uh, virtualization, another good reason. I mean, really, it's gonna take off. Uh, 10 gig, as you upgrade your backplane anyway, your backbone, think about how you can evolve that backbone from a hierarchical backbone to a zero trust backbone. The cloud is becoming big. I have people who, who cloud companies who use zero trust to build their cloud components because it helps create better uh, multi-tenancy. Uh, unified communications, a lot of networks have to be upgraded if you want to go to VoIP and that kind of stuff. Converged networking and software-defined networking are all the things that, uh, that are going on. I used to have IPv6 on here. Who, who asked about IPv6? Who was it, you? Yeah, so IPv6 is a really old concept, just to answer your question. Uh, one of my good friends who is one of the pioneers of the internet calls it a gr the great boondoggle. Uh, IPv6 is, is gonna be important for carriers, for mobile phones, but it won't be important for the enterprise because A, there's a lot of, un there's still a lot more IPv4 space than what everybody thinks there is, and B, if you're natting and doing some of those kinds of things, uh, you're, you don't need it in the enterprise, and C, there, it appears there's gonna be some real functional security uh, holes opened up if we go do a lot of IPv6. So you see the carriers wanting it for mobile phones, and that's a good reason. And you see governments wanting to do it just because sometimes they've been mandated to do it, but they don't have a reason why they're doing it. So I wouldn't look as, at IPv6 as having any more than just the cursory adoption than it has now. Okay, so let me summarize, right? You've heard your network is supposed to be like an m and hard and crunchy on the outside, soft and chewy on the inside. The problem with M&Ms is they melt in your mouth, not in your hand, right? So if all the M&Ms are eaten, were there ever any M&Ms ever there? This is what happens to our network. That's the old trust but verify network. It's an M&M. People can just grab them, take them, put them in their pocket, eat them later. Doesn't matter, you don't know what happens to your M&Ms. In fact, the best thing to do if you're stealing M&Ms is to eat all the M&Ms. I had, there were a lot of M&Ms in our house at Christmas time, and I ate almost all of them except a few, left a few to make it look like I hadn't eaten all of them, and that's what I got caught. If I would have eaten all of them, I don't think my wife would have caught me eating all the M&Ms, right? But I tried to be very stealthy and leave a few M&Ms in the jar, and she's like, what happened to all the M&Ms? And she didn't look at my kids either. She knew <laughs> where to look. So that's this network. It's soft and chewy. You know it is. It's easy to get into. It's easy to steal from. It just doesn't work, and it's old. This is the new network. It's a chocolate chip cookie. You're still going to have a lot of cool little, uh, oh, I got a laser pointer. Look at that. There's some data right there. Mmm, data, yummy data, yummy data. Oh, look at that. Good data. But hey, if you try to take a bite out of that, you're going to leave some crumbs. Somebody's gonna know that you were in there biting around the cookie. And by the way, notice that I put your cookies in high, avail high, high availability mode, right? HA cookies, very important. So that's why you should always take two. Okay, so that's this kind of network. It's hard and crunchy. Somebody takes a bite out of it, you're gonna know. Let me just summarize real quick. Zero trust means verify and never trust. Always a good idea in life, a better idea in IT. Inspect and log all the traffic, internal and external, so you know what's going on. Have situational awareness. Design your network from the inside out. Find your data that's toxic, that's important, that's critical, that has value to attackers, and figure out how you're gonna secure that. You want your controls as close to the data as possible, not as far away as the, on the edge of the perimeter the way they are now. Right now, we put our controls the farthest away possible from uh, from the data. It just makes no sense. We don't protect people that way, right? I mean, I'm sure there's bodyguards for your prime minister. They don't live in completely different cities from the prime minister and just, they're gonna randomly stop people and say, hey, are you planning on killing the prime minister today? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay, come, go on through. No, they hang out with the prime minister wherever that person is, right? Do you have a prime minister or a president? What do you, uh, see, I'm sorry, I don't know your political system. We don't wanna talk about it. You don't wanna talk about it? No, really. Okay. Well, I live in the Republic of Texas, so we, we, I think there's a president in the United States somewhere, but we don't really care. 
Uh, and then design with compliance in mind. You're going to have a lot of compliance pressures, right? All this stuff will allow you to embed security into the very DNA of your network so that the network and security, they're together. They're one thing. We're building secure networks, not networks, and then we're going to secure them later on. OK, any questions that I can answer for you before I step away? I'll be here the rest of the day hanging out, enjoying what I hope will be good food at lunch. Right. Well, I'm sure it will not be a barbecue, I'm pretty guaranteed to tell you, but... Well, I, we'll I assume we, that, yeah. We'll, well, thanks for an in, uh, inspiring talk. Uh, the cliché goes that you tell food for thought, but um, in this case, it's literally true. Uh, we know about your snack habits, too. Thanks for that. But Thank you. um, you've enlightened us on an important part, important concept. Um, you'll be available for any nitty-gritty uh, yeah. questions. We'll have a coffee break now. We will be back here in 15 minutes and learn about uh, developments in other parts of the network, which are, are at least as exciting. So, John, thanks very much. Thank you.